really suffer this. They w shall be filled and there'll be no... See, to American, you say that, they, they might say, oh, good, but they don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are some people still around that lived through the Great Depression. They're about 100 years old now, but they'll tell you what it was like to be hungry and um, be thankful for some government cheese and that sort of thing. But uh, very few people in America. But there are places that you preach that, that gets their attention. They say, oh, there's going to be a time where we won't ever hunger again. The best food and the perfect proportions forever. <laughs> and uh, that, I know it sounds too good to be true. Uh, sometimes we talked about the kingdom, but you, th you think, what else would God do? I mean, it's his kingdom. He's not going to give you bad food. He's not going to give you, you know, we, we'll be glorified. Will we hunger, get hungry? I, I, I doubt if we'll have that any kind of hunger as far as like we experience here on earth. But uh, we'll enjoy, I believe we'll enjoy food and I believe it'll be the best. And Jesus ate fish after he'd gone to the Father and been glorified. And he talked about uh, partaking of the cup and the bread uh, when he's in his kingdom. So we know they're going to be food. And I, what else could you expect? It's going to be the best. So verse 21 then continues and said, Blessed are you that weep now, for ye shall laugh. And nowhere in here does it say people who weep 24-7. It's just saying that life is rough. What is it, the old saying, the life is a veil of tears. Um, and, you know, we, we've had a lot of, a lot of, weeping over the last few months with uh, the coronavirus, but uh, also a lot of people not being able to get the treatment they need and dying of cancer and heart attacks and things because they couldn't get, and there's a lot of weeping. And if you're a Christian and you're going through something like that now, or you have, or you, and Lord knows if, if he tarries, he's telling you this because he knows you will. There'll be times you weep. Uh, widows. I married a widow. She can tell you what it was like uh, losing a spouse. Um, those of us who have suffered other losses like divorce or being stabbed in the back by your best friend and never... And ch yeah, your children. Uh, some of us have had children turn on us and um, we, we've wept. Well, as believers, we have uh, the future promise of... I love that, for ye shall laugh. How often do you think, I should say, do you think about laughing when in heaven? Not just smiling. It says laughing. <laughs> yeah, like our little grandbaby uh, Ezra and Gloria, it's according to her mood. And uh, we have these grandbabies, um, uh, Caroline, Samuel, and... Lydia, man, when they get to laughing, now that little Rebecca Joy, she just watches her siblings and just, <laughs> you know, just, and uh, you just think about heaven. What kind of laughing? If we can laugh with all this going on and all the things we put up, what is heaven going to be like? I think Jesus was funny at times, and I'm, I'll point those out when I see them. But uh, remember, when he says, if someone asks your uh, coat, give them your cloak also. And if you study a little bit about their culture, that meant you, it left you stand there in nothing but something that looked like a diaper. That would have been funny. And I think uh, people would have snickered at that kind of thing. Um, and I believe he'll make us laugh in the kingdom. Well, I think we are going to be in his presence. And I, he's not going to be a clown. <laughs> and some, there's, there's a couple of Jesus movies that came out in the... And in the last 20 years anyway, I can't remember exactly when, but, and they had Jesus just kind of being this, you know, I'm like, that's, it doesn't say he was walking around, you know, like a, not a goofball, but just a measured, normal sense of humor. He's, God, it, been, it would have been the perfect sense of humor, the perfect balance of laughter and tears. Jesus wept. He, he wept and he laughed. And so there's words. Look at the last. It says, for ye shall laugh. He <laughs> think about it. That's what we have ahead for us as believers in the kingdom. Verse 22 then says, blessed are ye when men shall hate you 
And when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. There are people who think that being hated means there's something wrong with you. They've been so falsely taught. One of the things that people think this is a comment when they say, Oh, such a sweet person. Didn't have an enemy in the world. My response is, what's wrong with them? There's something wrong with that. Everybody says, I want to be Christ-like. They killed him. What did they want to do with Jesus? They wanted to kill him. What? Did, what if, I just it blows my mind when I hear people talk like that. It says, when they shall separate you from their company. How many of you lost friends? People didn't want to be around you anymore when you became a Christian. Right now, a lot of you, I know some of you, and I know that you don't have hardly any friends or family that ask you or invite you to their homes or come around even before the coronavirus shutdown. They won't don't want to eat. They reproach you, talk bad about you, cast out your name as evil. And uh, as a pastor, I mean, I get this constantly. The, uh, the cults, people in the cults and people who preach this gospel of lasciviousness and deny repentance and, uh, and then people who deny the rapture, people who deny the literal trans, uh, uh, interpretation of scripture, people who deny the King James Bible and love their corrupt versions, on and on it goes. I'm labeled by them as a liar and a false teacher and a snake and all kinds of things they call me. Well, I'm... Um, right and they're wrong <laughs> on those issues and uh, it's not me it's the Bible uh, eternal security man uh, there's some people who get nasty about the fact that I preach eternal security and dispensations and they just call me everything in the book but I see that as being hated and have my name cast as evil for the son of man's sake and uh, the Bible says, blessed are ye. How about you? What are, uh, people ought, there ought to be some people who don't like you. There are, because if you do not compromise, again, it's not a blessing to be hated, but a blessing is coming because we are hated or shunned or reproached. In other words, you, you don't have to be twisted in your head and, and when someone hates you, think, oh, good, thank you. That's not what he's saying to do. Now, I know some people try to do that. Yeah, it's for the Son of Man's sake. True. But there are also people who are hated legitimately, and then, they, and then their response is, oh, wonderful. That's not what, what he's saying here. Jesus did not enjoy being hated. Jesus did not enjoy being rejected. He certainly didn't enjoy being crucified. But he had this knowledge as God in flesh that we can share in by God's word in writing. These words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. And if we believe God's word, then we have that in us. And we then can, ha having that knowledge of this coming blessing because we're hated, because we're shunned, because we're reproached, we can then enjoy the knowledge that this blessing is ours in the future. There's a blessing now in the sense of knowing the future reward. Don't, don't get mixed up on this and think you're supposed to enjoy that. If, if A lot of people, you know, think they're because they don't enjoy being hated, don't enjoy being reproached and shunned. You're, there's nothing wrong with you. You're normal. You're, it's, that's... A, Enjoy the actual, you know. So key words are there is what Jenny just mentioned. For the son of man's sake. It's uh, there. I've, I've had uh, been involved in jail ministry. And then I've worked in the Lucasville pen for about six months. And any of you around, if, if you're around in the 90s, you know, there's a big riot down there. I, and I, I worked after that. But it was still bad place <laughs> and bad characters there. And there was one guy there who told me he was a Christian. And um, then I heard him talking to someone else and he was telling them 
you know, if they became a Christian, that they could look at their imprisonment as suffering for the Lord's sake. And I was doing my job and couldn't interrupt, couldn't get involved in that conversation. But later on, I was able to explain to the guy that, um, you know, this, this promise of blessing, if you're thrown in prison or if you're, you know, uh, persecuted, he saw it as persecution. If you break the law and you go to jail, that's not what this is talking about. That's a consequence of sin. Um, but he then I explained to him that in his situation could still bring glory to God and enjoy reward if from this point forward he was faithful to the Lord, if he preached the gospel to the men he was in prison with, if he assisted the ministers that came in there and ministered to the men and all that sort of thing, uh, get gospel tracts sent to him and hand them out in the prison to people. And uh, I don't know that he did, but I hope he did. And uh, that's, that's the key was for the Son of Man's sake. Uh, you go to prison for, um, you know, assault, then you're not being persecuted. And that, that you're not going to be rewarded because that's not for the Son of Man's sake. But then once you're in prison, you can uh, earn reward. You can please the Lord. That's for the Son of Man's sake. Exactly. So verse 23, Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. Again, you're not leaping for joy uh, because you're being hated. You're re uh, leaping for joy because you know that as you endure the hatred and the shunning and the reproach for the Son of Man's sake, there's a reward ahead. That is an important difference that you've got to get if you really want to get this blessing the way God intended it. He says, for in the like manner did their fathers under the prophets. Uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I wish God would use me as a prophet and give me the prophecies. You better think twice about that. I mean, you go back and look at how they treated the prophets. And uh, a lot of them paid for it with their lives. And uh, the two witnesses in the Revelation uh, are going to have their heads chopped off and then, uh, then be revi uh, revived and, and all that. Uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not all fun and games being a true prophet of God. Um, but how do they treat those prophets? Keep that in mind. Um, that will affect your attitude as you suffer for the Lord because you know, hey, man, they, they did this to the prophets how much more to me? So not rejoicing about suffering itself, but in the reward to come, we can have, we can rejoice, we can leap for joy, we can be that thrilled by the idea of the future reward. And now we come to a turn in his approach in this message, and we learn that Jesus was not a positive thinker. Up to this point, he's been, you know, rejoice, blessed are ye, but here he steps on some toes, beginning in verse 24. And a reminder uh, regarding the four woes you're about to see. And I, I, should have, I should have mentioned this before we got into this, David. It needs to be said. This is not the same as the Sermon on the Mount. He does repeat some of the same things. But this is a different incident where Jesus is speaking possibly to some of the different people that weren't at the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but uh, there's no reason to believe this is the same thing, and that's why it's condensed and there's not as much material. But now he turns and he presents four woes. And uh, remember the hyperbole, overcasting um, for the sake of emphasis. These are pictures of the unsaved world. They sh the reason why there's such a woe is because this should not be true about a born-again believer. Um, it says in verse 24, But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Now what's he mean by that? Jesus refers to the rich in the sense of um, uh, people who make money for power. And what we talked about in our Roman study, uh, it, it's lust for power, it's greed, and it leads to con 
concupiscence <laughs> is the word. I said it real good during Sunday school, and then I tripped over my tongue there. Concupiscence was the word in um, Romans 7. But making money is fine if you're a Christian who uses it for the glory of God. I've known a couple of fairly wealthy men who used their money, a lot of their money, a, a good deal of their money, to support the Lord's work. And, uh, you know, there's one fella who uh, every time I'd go to a particular church and uh, they'd take up a love offering and um, he would find out from the pastor how much they gave and he had in his mind a, an amount that they should give me and then he would give me the difference. And, uh, you know, I, somebody told me, said, well, he shouldn't have given it directly to you. He should have still put it in the offering for the, and all that. And I don't know the circumstances, but I'll tell you what, there's one time where he gave me the money I needed to get where I was going. I wouldn't have even had gas money um, one time if he hadn't done that. If you make money, that's not a sin, but it's what do you do with the money? And of course, this is true about anything. You have talent, you have opportunity, whatever. You should use it for the glory of God. And it, so making money is fine, but when Jesus refers to these rich, they are so because they hoard the money. And they don't use it to help people. They don't support the local church. They don't, uh, uh, you know, see people in need and take care, help to take care of those needs and that sort of thing. Some of the most embarrassed Christians at the judgment will be the tightwads. Um, and some will be wasteful. There will be some people who made a lot of money and wasted so much money. And then said, oh, I just couldn't give much to the Lord's work because, you know, I just didn't have much. Well, you had it, but you wasted it. Or you, then there are other people who have money. They have the ability to support the Lord's work, and they don't. And, of course, I've talked a couple of times about people who die, and without a, a will or anything, not giving any thought to using that savings account, life insurance policy, stocks, bonds, whatever, property, they could use that for the glory of the Lord. Instead, they die and leave it to a bunch of godless relatives or to the state. And they lose out big time an opportunity to use that money for the, the Lord's uh, glory. And uh, that really should not be the mark of a Christian. It's sad when you ever see that. And uh, this next verse clearly speaks of these as lost and going to hell. Look at verse 25. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Now that's not describing heaven. We already talked about how in heaven you're going to be, uh, there'll be no hunger. Uh, in heaven, uh, once that great white throne judgment takes place, there'll be no more tears. God will wipe away all tears. So these people, according to this, uh, this is the mark of an unsaved man. So if a Christian somehow sees themselves described here, you better get things right. There's something wrong. Were you saved in the first place? Have you been saved? I don't go around like a lot of guys always trying to make people doubt their salvation, and a lot of them do it so they can get people up the altar. There's no altar call here. This is between you and God, but you should not find yourself described in these verses 24, 25, 26. Um... Woe unto you that are full. In other, in other words, overindulgent goof-offs is how I would... Those that are full, those who... It says laugh now. He's speaking to people who just are spending all their time just trying to have a good time. Nothing wrong with a good laugh. We already talked about that. There's going to be laughter in heaven. But again, this is people who constantly are in laughter, always trying to just have a good... Never take anything serious. There is a time to laugh, and there's, Ecclesiastes talks a lot about this. There's a time to cry. There's a time to be just, you know, relaxed and, and not stressed or anything, but there's a time to take things serious. And uh, when it says, woe unto you who are full, that's not talking about people who are overweight, um, because that happens to a lot of people because of their metabolism and age. 
Woe unto you that are full, meaning they just are uh, gluttons. They're constantly, it's all about me, 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 fulfilling uh, my desires. And they eat constantly and they waste so much money on uh, uh, food and, and, and fulfilling uh, every desire instead of thinking of how they can serve the Lord and glorify Him with what they have and help and serve others. And this fourth woe has special application to today's fake preachers. Look at verse 26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Uh, they, there's some preachers that, you know, I, we've got a one hour documentary on Billy Graham. Um, we've got, and then of course there are a lot, a whole lot out there about people like Joel Osteen and uh, Rick Warren, and you know, uh, almost everything I find criticizing them are from Bible believing Christians. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, when the godless speak well of you. When the sodomites, the LGBTQ movement, speak well of you. Muslims speak well of you. Atheists. You know, when somebody years ago said, uh, well, if all Christians were like so-and-so, I wouldn't have a problem with you. And I said, that's why I have a problem with so-and-so. You're a godless atheist by profession. You should hate that man if he's a real Christian. That's the truth. And it's just funny that I know men, I've known them personally, who really did think that if they were doing things right, everybody would love them. And I said, I, I don't understand why that troubles you that somebody don't like you. It's not, you should only ask yourself one question. Am I doing the right thing? Am I serving the Lord correctly? Am I preaching the truth? And if you are, then so be it. That's it. The majority of professing Christians today just simply do not believe this verse. <laughs> and uh, they look for Christian, they look for pastors who actually fulfill that. They look for pastors who never say anything to offend anybody. Pastors who never preach on things that are controversial. There are churches now who will not, the pastors will not preach on anything that touches politics. They're fakes. There are pastors who will not preach on the matter of homosexuality and gay marriage because so-and-so and so-and-so -so have a boy or a girl who's a queer or lesbian. Shame on you. You're fakes. Anyone preaching without compromise will be hated. Uh, one of the ways I've heard it put is that people, should, people know or should know you as much by your enemies as by your friends. And uh, I, look at, I look at that every once in a while. I think, you know, I, I don't know of anybody who really is a King James Bible-believing Christian who isn't a kook um, who has anything against me on a personal level or anything, and I try to keep it that way. That's what each of us have to do. I can only do that for me. You can only do that for you. But I want to look real quick at 1 John 3. 1 John 3, 11 through 13. We'll wrap it up shortly. 1 John 3, 11 through 13. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Why? Because the way it ought to be is we love each other, but the world hates us. Verse 12 says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, which Christians do whack each other down, cut their legs out from under each other and all that sort of thing. A lot of times covetousness, as we talked about. And wherefore slew he him? Why did he kill him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. In other words, it... A lot of people even call you brother and they'll see you doing the right thing and serving the Lord and they will try to cut you down to make themselves feel better about the fact they're not doing anything or they're doing the wrong thing. And I've had that happen. Verse 13, 
Look at this. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. He's saying they ought to. <laughs> the unsaved world ought to hate you. That's why Christians need to love each other. If we don't, nobody else will. I mean, born again, Bible believing, Jesus loving, sold out Christians, the world isn't going to like you. They're going to hate you. And that's why we need to love each other. And closing thoughts on that matter, Christians are so blessed. We simply must remember that and act like it. Remember about your Christian brothers and sisters what we were just saying. The world, if you're doing it right, the world should want to kill you. And that then is countered by the fact that if you're doing it right in the churches, local churches and among brethren, Christian brethren, we should love one another. God has put it in us to want to be loved. But you shouldn't want love from the wrong sources. And uh, the marriage is an example of that. Who do you love and who loves you? On an on a intimate, personal, marital level, there's only one person on the planet that you get that kind of love from and share that kind of love. And the church, we are the bride of Christ. And the only place we, we ought to ever find real, genuine, godly love is among the brethren. And if you think you're getting that from the unsaved uh, world, there's something, something wrong there. Love one another. And you'll, you'll also do that as you look around. You realize all these things, blessed are ye, that's coming in the kingdom. And we're all going to be there together. You better love that guy or that gal. And some people are hard to love. You might not even be able to stand to be around them for five minutes at a time, but you should still love them. I had somebody say, I love them enough not to get around them because I might kill them. Well, show the love you can. Pray for patience to endure whatever it is gets under your skin about that person. Put limits. For the sake of love, for the sake of your relationship, you might put limits. And only be around them a certain amount of time. But you still love them and pray for them. And realize you're going to be with them forever. They're a part of the family. We're going to be together forever. Amen. Only trust them. Jesus is the truth.